A tiny spacecraft tears through the night sky and crashes into a Kansas cornfield. Farmers rush over, expecting wreckage. Instead, they find a baby, not just any baby, a child who will one day bend steel, fly faster than jets, and save lives on a global scale. But here's the twist. Forget the comics for a second. Could this story actually make sense? Could our yellow sun really turn that child into a god among men? That's our mission today. We'll break it into three parts. First, the apocalypse, how a baby could possibly escape Krypton's destruction. Second, the sun, what it would take for sunlight to supercharge his body. And third, the reality check. If Superman really existed here on Earth, would he be our savior or our biggest threat? By the end, you'll get the verdict. Plausible science or pure fantasy. And I want you in on this. Tell me in the comments, is Superman science fiction or science possible? All right, cape on, let's rewind to the very end of Krypton. Imagine standing on a planet moments before it rips itself apart. Krypton didn't go quietly. In most versions of the lore, its end wasn't a slow decline. It was violent. The planet's core destabilized, rupturing outward in a cataclysm that made volcanoes and earthquakes look like firecrackers. We're talking planetary scale energy release. So here's the problem. How does one tiny infant survive that? A blast of that size would vaporize cities, ignite the atmosphere, and eject debris into space at hypersonic speeds. Imagine Earth suddenly splitting open. The energy would be comparable to detonating millions of nuclear warheads at once. Against that backdrop, a baby making it out alive sounds laughable. Unless we give Krypton science its due credit. Step one is the pot itself. No ordinary craft survives a planet's implosion, but Krypton wasn't ordinary. In comics, their technology is consistently portrayed as centuries or even millennia beyond ours. For comparison, NASA's Parker Solar Probe gets within 7 million kilometers of the sun. It survives thanks to its carbon composite shield only 11 centimeters thick, holding off temperatures over 1300 degrees Celsius. If 21st century humans could build that, imagine what Kryptonians could do. Their escape pod may have been made of exotic alloys, composites, or even materials that absorb and redirect radiation instead of letting it pass through. The second factor, timing. The pod gets dragged back by Krypton's gravity. Too late, it's pulverized by debris. Jor-El, Superman's father, had to calculate the golden window, launching at the precise millisecond where the shockwaves opened a corridor into space. And honestly, that's one of the rare times the comics get the physics right. If you had one shot to launch your kid through an apocalypse, would you trust the math or take the risk? Let me know in the comments. Now comes biology. Even if the pod withstood the blast, an infant couldn't survive radiation, pressure changes, or sheer acceleration. So how? Here's one theory. Kryptonians didn't treat Kal-El like a fragile baby. They treated him like a biological seed. On Earth, some seeds can survive decades, underground, fires, floods, or even space exposure. They wake up only when the environment is right. What if Kryptonians engineered their children the same way? Kal-El's tissues could have been dormant, resilient, even radiation resistant, until Earth's conditions triggered normal growth. That turns him from a helpless infant into a survival capsule of his own. Think of it like combining a NASA probe with a hibernating tardigrade, the toughest microscopic animal on Earth. That's Superman's first survival trick. But that's just one step, because once the pod reached Earth, something stranger happened. Under our yellow sun, the child became something his homeworld never imagined. In DC lore, the sun is everything. Krypton orbited a red star, cooler and weaker in its radiation. Its people lived under that light like we live under ours, nothing special. But when Kal-El landed on Earth, the game changed. Our yellow sun blasted him with high energy photons and suddenly his biology lit up. So the big question, could sunlight really turn someone into Superman? On Earth, sunlight is just electromagnetic radiation. It warms our skin, helps plants grow, and powers solar panels. A sunny day delivers about 1,000 watts per square meter at noon. Plants use only a few percent of that. Humans, essentially zero. We run on food, not photons. 
So for Superman's biology to make sense, his cells would need to harvest solar energy like the most efficient panels ever imagined, beyond any technology we've built. Imagine every cell in Kal-El's body is like a microscopic solar panel. Every photon that hits him gets stored, not as sugar, but as exotic molecular bonds, basically high-density energy batteries stacked in his cells. Fans call this the photonucleic effect, not official canon, but a useful metaphor. His body becomes a living power plant, always charging, never running out. Imagine walking around with the energy output of the Hoover Dam stored inside you. That's Superman after a day in the sun. But let's be honest, even that stretches biology. A peak human sprinter uses maybe 1,000 watts. Superman catching a crashing jet requires outputs closer to gigawatts, the scale of power plants feeding entire cities. That's not just more efficient metabolism, that's biology that rewrites the rules of physics. Could evolution do that? Probably not. But Kryptonian science? Maybe. If they genetically tune their species for high radiation environments, then under the right sun. Kal-El's body goes from ordinary to supercharged. So here's the question. If you could rewrite your DNA to run on sunlight alone, would you do it? Now we move from charging up to powering feats. Strength, flight, and vulnerability. Where do those come from? Classic comics point to Krypton's gravity, much heavier than Earth's. Kryptonians evolved with denser bones, stronger muscles, and tougher tissues just to survive daily life. That means when Kal-El arrives here, he's basically an Olympic athlete playing on the kiddie field. It's the John Carter effect. Put someone from a high-gravity world on a low-gravity one, and suddenly they're leaping like superheroes. That explains the baseline strength, but it doesn't explain catching trains or stopping collapsing skyscrapers. For that, we need more. Here's where the solar battery theory connects. Kal-El's muscles don't just burn glucose like ours. They tap into those photon-derived reserves, releasing bursts of power far beyond normal biology. Each contraction is like flipping on a power generator. A human punch is like firing a baseball. Superman's punch is like firing a freight train. That's the scale we're talking. Strength is one thing. Flight is another. You can't just jump harder to hover in midair. Comics show him floating silently, changing direction without wings or jets. If he were using thrust, every takeoff would leave a crater. So the only halfway plausible explanation? He manipulates gravity or fields around him. Some stories call it his aura, an invisible field powered by his solar reserves. Think of it like generating a localized anti-gravity bubble. That would explain hovering, supersonic speed without fire trails, and even why clothes or people he carries don't rip apart mid-flight. And here's the kicker. With that much strength, control matters more than raw energy. Catching a falling person? Do it wrong, and the whiplash alone would kill them. Landing from flight? If he doesn't bleed momentum carefully, he hits the ground like artillery. Superman's real power isn't strength, it's precision. Without it, every rescue is a disaster waiting to happen. Here's the scary part. If Superman were real, physics says his very presence is dangerous. Catching someone mid-fall, unless he perfectly matches their speed and decelerates gradually, the person's organs keep moving even if their body stops. That means fatal injuries, even in a rescue. Flying at supersonic speeds, every time he breaks the sound barrier, he creates shock waves that can shatter windows miles away. Do it over a city, and he's causing millions in damage. Even his fights are apocalyptic. A single punch at his speed compresses air like an explosion. In comics, buildings collapse around him during battles. In reality, entire city blocks would be leveled. And then there's heat vision, hot enough to melt steel. That much radiant energy could ignite structures unintentionally. Freeze breath? Suddenly cooling can shatter materials like glass or metal, destabilizing buildings. These secondary powers would be disasters if used recklessly. Be honest, what scares you more? Superman losing control for a second, or a villain hijacking his power? Drop it below. All of this leads to one conclusion. Superman's greatest ability isn't lifting skyscrapers or flying faster than jets. It's restraint. The constant judgment to use a fraction of what he could, 
Without that restraint, he's not a savior. He's a natural disaster with a cape. So where does that leave us? On paper, Superman is pure fantasy. A baby surviving a planetary explosion? A body that runs on solar energy? That takes cellular processes unlike anything on Earth. But here's the twist. When you look closely, the comics don't hand wave everything. They root his powers in concepts we recognize. Gravity, radiation, energy storage. They stretch them until they snap. Sure, but the seeds of science are there. And maybe that's why Superman endures. He isn't just myth. He's the question of what happens when biology meets physics at a scale we can barely imagine. But in the end, the real superpower isn't strength. It's restraint. The moral choice to hold back, to live among us without crushing us. So, plausible or pure fantasy? You tell me. Comment your verdict and don't forget to subscribe for more science meets fiction deep dives. Because when we pull back the cape, Superman isn't just about what we could do under another sun. He's about what we choose to be right here under our own.